and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Live It Up with Vitality 65 plus event. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. It can only be in your best interest. Now, I thought I still had a long way to go before I should be interested in something like this. But can I tell you, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody called me Auntie Uveka. And I said, okay, so I'm well on my way. This product or something like it is going to be so relevant to me. I need to start paying attention now. So I'm so glad that Discovery Vitality actually has something like this that I know is probably going to be even bigger and better in about 20 years time when I hit 65 to take care of my needs. So it really, really makes me feel that much safer. Now, as we know, we, we've been told by experts for many, many years now that as the human race, we are actually living longer. Believe it or not, with the stresses and strains of modern day life, we are actually living longer. We are taking care of ourselves better. So, you know, whether it is about health and well-being, whether we are exploring how you and your loved ones over the age of 65 actually live to the full and, and actually age well, because yes, we are aging well as well. You know, they say 60 is the new 40 and you see it in many, many people. We see it in our relatives. We see that they are actually aging so well. I can't even remember the last time I saw someone with wrinkles over the age of 60. And I have, my parents are well into their 70s. They're in their mid 70s. I have my in-laws who are over 60 and they're actually watching. They're part of this webinar. Hi, Gran. And if you see my mother-in-law, I can tell you she's one hot granny. So she's definitely on the right track when it comes to taking care of herself. But my parents and my in-laws are so independent. They really want to do everything for themselves. They don't live with sons or daughters. They don't live in retirement villages. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's just because they want to continue living the way they live. I mean, you wouldn't even find a gray hair on any one of their heads because they are really, really, I think their vitality age must be about 30 or something at this point. So, and they can party it up, I can tell you, with the best of us. And my mother-in-law can put me under the table when it comes to partying as well. And I wanna make sure that my parents and my in-laws as well can actually continue to live this life Till, you know, till, till they're tired of it, which they're not tired of doing anymore. They really, really, really want to get the best out of life, enjoy time with their children and their grandchildren, and possibly, hopefully, their great-grandchildren. So I am so glad that we have products like this that are out there that are going to help them achieve this. And we've got such a wonderful panel today who are going to help us on the road. And if you hear who they are, or when you hear who they are, you are gonna know that you are in the safest hands of such professionals. So let me introduce to you uh, this afternoon, Dr. Deepak Patel. And uh, you're going to see what he looks like. You're going to see who he is right now. Dr. Deepak, Deepak Patel is the principal clinical specialist at Vitality South Africa. Now, just so you know, just how smart a guy he is, he obtained his undergraduate medical degree and his postgraduate pediatric qualifications from the University of the Vidvata that's not all folks. In addition to his medical qualifications, he has an honors degree in development studies from the University of Witts and a master's in sports medicine from the University of Cape Town. Now, Dr. Patel is tasked together with others in the research and development team with ensuring the scientific integrity of the Vitality Program. Doc, thank you so much for your time and welcome to our event today. Our next panelist, actually needs no introduction. He's almost like superhuman, almost like a superhero. And that is none other than Bruce Fordyce. Now you know who Bruce, Bruce Fordyce is. And if you don't, I think you've been living under a rock for the past couple of decades as well. He's probably best known for having won South Africa's Comrades Marathon. Get this, nine times in that time, he set five new course records and has run 30 30, get that folks, 30 Comrades Marathons to date. In addition, he's won numerous other marathons, including the famous London to Brighton. And he's done that three times. Now in 1983, in that London to Brighton race, he set a world 50 mile or 80 kilometer, if you want to do the maths record of four hours, 50 minutes and 21 seconds. Now that record still remains unbroken to date. It's the year 2020, folks. That's a long time. Nobody's been able to beat Bruce in that one. In 1997, of course, he had to be awarded uh, something for this. How could he not? He was given the state president's gold award for sport by Nelson Mandela. Now, most recently, Bruce has taken all that experience and put it to good use to help the rest of us get off our butts as well. So he's launched the Parkrun concept in South Africa 
And that has grown to nearly 200 Saturday morning, five kilometer free time runs. And it has over 1 million registered members. And I hope that most of you watching here uh, make up part of that 1 million. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thanks for, for sitting still, I think, and not trying to, you know, I'm sure we've, we've, we've interrupted your afternoon 20 kilometer jog. So thank you so much. For thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Sebastiana Kalula. Now she is an Emeritus Associate Professor and Specialist Physician in Medicine and Geriatric Medicine at the University of Cape Town and Kutuskir Hospital. She's the Director of the Institute of Aging in Africa, so she knows what she's talking about, and the Co-Director of the International Longevity Center South Africa at UCT. Her research interests include Falls in older person, yes, that is a real concern. HIV and aging, quality and safety in healthcare for older adults and physical and cognitive functioning. Dr. Kulula, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy research and I'm sure your busy work to be here with us today. And you are going to be talking to us about falls risks as well. So we're gonna have a demo. We're not gonna ask Dr. Kulula to demo that for us. Instead, we have the lovely Marie Leach. She's the Vitality in-house biokineticist and she's going to be doing a falls risk assessment demonstration for us. Let's see where, where is Marie Leach because she's, uh, she's going to be doing something very physical for us. So you can see that she's in her rooms and that she's going to be doing that for us a little later. So let's get started, shall we? So we can equip you with all the information you need so that 65 plus becomes the new 45 plus for you, that your vitality age actually stays 45 plus. All right, Dr. Deepak Patel, let's start with you. And again, welcome and thank you so much for your time. So you started off as a pediatrician, which is very fascinating for me because now you're involved in the other spectrum when it comes to age, you're involved with 65 plus. So, so tell us how you actually came full circle. What led you from dealing with, you know, when we were born, to now at this stage where we need to sort of stay alive for much longer? So, Rebecca, um, I've been with uh, Vitality for close on to about 13 or 14 years now. Um, and I've always been in, uh, interested in prevention, health promotion. Uh, so the jump from pediatrics to health promotion wasn't difficult at all. Uh, it's only recently, actually, fortuitously, that I'm involved in the seniors, uh, what we call the 65 program. And that has been really an eye opener. I think I've been very fortunate in working with this program. Uh, it's given me new insight into kind of the importance of health promotion from a very young age. But it's also given me a new insight into the importance of health from the age, from kind of older age and how one should approach old age positively. I mean, everyone is yeah. going to get old if they're going to live long enough. Um, and also it's given me a certain level of empathy, some, a certain level of understanding uh, of what people in old age experience. So it hasn't really been a, a difficult transition at all. And it's been quite um, revealing. Um, I've really uh, kind of expanded my knowledge, my understanding. Well, it's so great because, you know, often in society these days, we hear more and more about putting our, our seniors out to pasture. And it's so great to have a program like this that actually recognizes that there are needs that Eight, you know, our seniors are more alive than ever and they really want to have the tools at hand to actually live the best life that they can. So bring, give us some insight into what the objectives of this program actually are and, and the science behind it, please, Dr. Patel. Okay, so I've put up a, a short presentation. I hope I can keep it uh, short. Uh, can you see that presentation? Uh, we can see your screen. Yes, we can. Right. So, okay. So, uh, the World Health Organization has declared that de uh, the decade 2020 to 2030, the decade of healthy aging. And old age, as I've mentioned, provides opportunities to continue to make uh, major contributions. However, the, the extent of these opportunities depend heavily on one thing, and that is uh, health. Uh, we know that as you get older, the prevalence of certain diseases, particularly chronic diseases, 
uh, heart disease, stroke, and chronic lung disease increases. Uh, and they're also responsible for, for death. Uh, infections are common in the background of these chronic diseases. Presently, I mean, we're all seized by the COVID-19 epidemic and is probably the most threatening infection uh, affecting older adults. And that's illustrated in this graph. Uh, we know that older people are more likely to be hospitalized, but older people need not um, become infected with COVID. I think it's important that they take measures to protect themselves until you know, we have uh, a vaccine that's effective. Uh, it's sheltering is important. Sheltering means staying at home and distancing, physical distancing of at least one and a half to two meters, uh, wearing a mask when outside, uh, obsessively washing your hands um, or using a sanitizer when one's outside. It's important to manage chronic conditions. It's important to keep fit and uh, eating well and losing weight. Um, chronic conditions are hypertension, diabetes. So it's important that all the people who are more afflicted with these conditions manage these conditions well. And our own data see, uh, shows that uh, people who are very engaged with our program have uh, less severe disease compared to, to people who are less engaged or not on vitality. But while certain chronic conditions do afflict older people, it's also true that actually one can ward off for a long period uh, these conditions. So there's this really quite wonderful study published in The Lancet last year, which looked at aging in over 90 countries. And one takeaway that I found quite fascinating was that 76 year olds in Japan and 46 year olds in Papua New Guinea had the same level of age related health uh, problems as an average person aged 65. What that means is people in Japan are aging more healthily, they're more productive, they uh, not just for, for society, but for themselves um, and more engaged. And the reverse is true for people in, in Papua New Guinea. I mean, they both, they kind of the extremes. Um, so one of the best ways to ensure health in old age is to deliver people into old age in as healthy a state as possible. And that's uh, an approach that, in a sense, vitality promotes. Um, and also, uh, we know that people are living longer. You mentioned that. Uh, mm -hmm. But what's not entirely true of everyone is that they're living healthier. So the objective is not only to get people to live longer, but to compress, and that's uh, a phrase that's being used, to compress morbidity. In other words, live longer and healthier. And the vitality shared model really uh, captures some of this. Uh, vitality provides a platform for our members to be healthy. Uh, healthy members have a big influence on claims, lower claims. Um, and they contribute to a healthier society, uh, particularly uh, in old age. And you have this virtuous cycle, um, which is a kind of non-zero sum game. Uh, in other words, it's a win-win situation for everyone. Um, so what are the pillars of good health in old age? Well, they're very much the same for for everyone really, even for younger people. Um, firstly, and importantly, and I'll, um, my next slide deals with this in a bit more detail, is to be physically active and exercise regularly. Uh, I've said physically active and exercise because 
activity is leisure time activity, it's um, activity of daily living, uh, cleaning the house, gardening, etc. And exercise is focus activity, focus, physical activity that increases your heart rate or strength exercise, or flexibility. Um, eat in moderation and we've had uh, several kind of webinars talking about uh, eating healthily. Uh, obviously not to smoke or abuse alcohol, stay mentally and socially active, sleep, which is becoming a very hot topical issue, a minimum of seven hours, even for older people. And importantly for older people to do your recommended screening vaccination and manage your chronic condition. And there's good evidence that one can extend um, one's lifespan by as much as 14 years if one actually uh, follows these lifestyle uh, factors compared to people who don't. So just a few words on physical activity. It's such a strong part of our program. In recent years, um, you know, the slogan exercise is medicine has taken root in the medical community. There are many countries that have adopted it and are promoting physical activity as an, in, as an intervention uh, for many chronic condition, many conditions, some of which are uh, slowing what physical activity does. It slows cardiac aging. So we know the heart is a pump. The pump begins to, to work less effectively with age but physical activity actually maintains its efficiency. Um, also, you have a reduced incidence of heart disease, everyone knows that, and strokes with physical activity. Uh, hypertension can be controlled, improve weight management, reduce incidence of diabetes and better management of diabetes, uh, reduces muscle loss, um, which is common in, in old age called sarcopenia. It reduces bone loss, uh, again common in, um, in older ages called osteoporosis, uh, and improves arthritis, uh, which is probably the most common cause of fun functional incapacity in old age. Uh, also improves cognitive health, and Dr. Kalula will deal with that, and mental health, and many cancers. So, let me dive then into um, some aspects of our program, the 65 plus program. I don't have the time to go into every aspect of it, um, but basically we follow uh, the general vitality schema, which is know your health, improve your health and get rewarded. Um, and there's a big emphasis on knowing your health because as I mentioned, there are many chronic diseases, many silent chronic diseases that afflict older people and knowing your health is important. Uh, and then more important probably is engaging in healthy activity, physical activity, healthy eating, et cetera. And then of course, we're an incentive-based program and we'll, we'll reward healthy behavior. Uh, at a very simple level, um, We've changed uh, our physical activity sort of cutoffs. We, and the intention behind this is to get, uh, firstly, people who are not physically active to become physically active uh, by walking. So we're giving more points for, for just steps that you take in the day. And also we realize that there's increasing functional incapacity with age. So we're giving more points for heart rate workouts of uh, low, lower intensity but greater duration um, and moderate in intensity workouts. The details are all available on our, uh, on our website and will be available on the Facebook page as well. Um, also, we've relaxed some of the vitality health check uh, cutoffs, particularly the waist circumference uh, and blood pressure, more in keeping with uh, the guidelines and uh, clinical evidence. 
Um, and we're strongly promoting uh, vaccination. Um, I think people 65 years old actually have lived experience of things like polio. Um, you know, I know uh, in my childhood, there were, there were young people who were afflicted with polio. Polio is virtually non-existent in most parts of the world. Um, and that's because of vaccination. So I hope there aren't very many anti-vaxxers in uh, the 65 plus age group. I don't think they are but we're promoting vaccine. It's one of uh, the greatest kind of medical invention in my opinion. And flu ex the flu vaccine, um, which people should get every year, it's true it doesn't work in every instance, but it is effective uh, for most people. Pneumococcal vaccine, also uh, shingles, which is uh, recommended after the age of 60. But you should talk to your doctor about that. Uh, in the Vitality Health Check, we've introduced uh, a yearing screen. Uh, we know that about 50% of people 65 years of age have uh, a significant yearing uh, impairment, and that increases to about 80% at age 85. So we've introduced this uh, yearing screen, we've introduced a visual acuity screen, Again, people 65 plus are more at risk for developing visual problems, including um, things like cataract, glaucoma, which I'm a kind of living example of, uh, and macular degeneration. And then we've uh, also in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the vitality health check introduced a false risk assessment. <clears throat> And we'll talk much more about that. Uh, Marie will demonstrate and Dr. Kalula will talk about that. <clears throat> uh, we've also encouraged people based on that screening to see the right healthcare professional. Uh, and in that context, we've uh, over and above kind of visiting the optician, audiologist, or your GP, uh, We've introduced a functional assessment, uh, functional impairment we know, and I've mentioned uh, increasing, increases with aging. And this functional assessment done with a biokinetics is not only to pick up uh, that functional impairment, but to actually rehab. Uh, and biokinetics will be giving a program of rehab uh, based on that. And there's additional points for that. I won't go into the rewards, but we have uh, very uh, rich rewards around Apple Watch, um, around active rewards for people 65 plus, and uh, also uh, up to 50% of health monitoring devices, such as blood pressure machines, glucometers, scales. Um, finally, I just want to talk a bit about uh, driving. Um, we think driving is a, is a health issue and we all know that as people get older uh, it becomes more of a challenge driving. Uh, visual and hearing difficulties, slow reaction time, medication can all impair kind of driving and it's important that people drive less in peak traffic and at night as they get older. They drive safe, uh, slowly with a safe uh, following distance. And our Discovery Insure uh, company has designed a Vitality Drive reward that offers clients older than 65, um, a reduction in the annual premium of up to 50% every year at a time when really I think people in retirement need it most. And that's dependent on um, proactively managing their health by having that vitality health check for 65 plus, which includes, as I said, a visual hearing assessment, falls risk assessment, um, and also by driving well and having a low monthly mileage. So to end, um, to quote George Bernard Shaw, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old 
because we stopped playing. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Oh, I absolutely love that, Dr. Patel. So stay with me for a moment. We want to say hello to our participants who've joined us on Facebook and other social media platforms if they were a little delayed getting in. And if you missed the start uh, of our webinar, just a reminder to you that the entire webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Vitality Facebook page. And we'd also like you to participate. If you look at the bottom of your screens, there's a Q&A box. Please pop in your questions there and we'll try and answer as many as we can towards the end of today's session. Now, Dr. Patel, just based on everything you've said here, and I often joke with my husband and I say, you know what? When I retire and I hit 65, I'm gonna let myself go. I'm gonna brush my teeth with chocolate and I'm going to gargle with tequila. But what you've told me today means that I have to more than ever start to actually take better care of myself at that point because for most people, life can be beginning at that stage. You can discover a whole new world for yourself at 65 and over. So I would say, you know, um, that you should do what you said you will, you're going to do, but do it once a month. Uh, <laughs> On a Friday. <laughs> so in moderation, you know, there's no such a thing as you shouldn't do this or that, you know, uh, things that you enjoy, you really, I think, should continue enjoying. But I think uh, one has to be prudent at every stage in life, uh, but especially, I guess, as you get older and if you are afflicted uh, with some of these chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. not a good idea, for instance, if you have diabetes to brush your of course. Uh, your teeth with chocolate every day. Not even dark chocolate. <laughs> Especially not dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad that this is recorded. So I have proof that you said I can do it once a month. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to this in 20 years. Um, Dr. Patel, thank you so much for that great presentation and just laying it out basically for us as well so that, you know, us ordinary folk can actually understand this. So thanks so much. That's Dr. Deepak Patel. If you missed his introduction, he's the Principal Clinical Specialist at Vitality South Africa. Now, next up, we, like I said earlier, this is somebody who needs no introduction. Bruce Fordyce, good afternoon and welcome. And, you know, good just afternoon. Today, brings back such wonderful memories for me because when I was little and still living at home, actually, I lived at home till I was quite old, I'm ashamed to say. My so tradition with my dad, <laughs> every, every comrades, every, every June was to get up when, when that starting gun went off, we made our black coffee and we sat eating our donuts while we watched the start of the race. So you've just given me a moment of nostalgia just seeing you there. So how are you? What are you up to these days? Um, I'm, I'm very well. I, I hope you continue to watch the comrades, by the way. I'm, I'm a, a member of Team Vitality and we have wonderful runners there at, uh, at comrades. Um, and the race now is very exciting, so it's worth watching. Um, yes, my main passion now is, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, is parkrun. And obviously with COVID restrictions, we, we can't at the moment parkrun. Uh, but I am fighting very hard to get parkrun back because, uh, first of all, it's health-related, health uh, you know, the, the running and the exercise and the walking. But most importantly, it's community. It's about people getting together and people are lonely in this lockdown. Uh, and we are desperate to get people together. Uh, because that's really what it's all about. Saturday morning community, getting together, exercising, and then just socializing with each other. And that's, uh, that's my passion now is Parker. Well, that goes to what Dr. Patel just said when he quoted uh, uh, Bernard Shaw saying that you only get old when you stop playing. And this, this is exactly it. You keep active, you do, you do these exactly. things. Like 65, Bruce, you're, you're going to be 65. When's the big day so we can send you a present? Yes, well, I'm, I'm still 64, and I was a Beatles fan when I was young, and I never thought that I would hum to myself the Beatles song, When I Get Older, uh, losing my hair many years from now when I'm 64. But I'm about to be 65, yeah, 3rd of December. Uh, but I love what Dr. Patel had to say, because I'm not 65. I'm, uh, I behave like a teenager, and I know physically I'm probably in my 40s. Uh, I, I can still run a good 5K at a park run. Um, and I ran the Two Oceans Ultra Marathon 18 months ago. Wow. So I'm still around. Yeah, I'm still very active. Giving them a run for their money. Definitely, you are doing that. So, so let's talk about how you, how you actually manage this. How has Vitality helped you be able to, to live your life at the moment to the best and fullest? Well, I, I look at the advice they give, you know, the, the Vitality Health Checks. I love the fact that Dr. Patel said uh, vaccinate. I do that every year. Um, 
I have the checks and then I just stay active. And what I've done is I've made, uh, in my case, running, but also some gym work, a part of every day. And so that my day is not complete unless I have done that. Um, and in fact, I, I can take a day off. That's fine. We all enjoy a day off. But if I haven't had my exercise for the day, I feel there's something wrong. I feel greasy. I feel odd. Um, I need my hit. I'm, an, I'm addicted to exercise. And we're, apparently we get endorphins from exercise. And I need my hit of endorphins every day. Um, and yeah, this morning I ran with my group of mates, 10Ks this morning. And later on, our lovely lady came and... Uh, with my family, we had our gym session, um, and it would be yeah, it would be a, a a huge hole in my day if I didn't do something. Oh, that's fantastic! And yes, I, I completely agree. And I mean, I only started running, I think, a couple of years ago, and it actually does become addictive. And, and the more you do it, the more you want to do. But I'm not brave enough to run outside like you do, uh, you know, treadmill running as well. But I'd like a caution from your side, Bruce, because like, you know, the caution is always, yes, we want our, our, our seniors to stay active, but don't start running marathons now, I suppose, if you haven't done them for the longest time in your life before this, yes? Well, you, you've got to start very gently and easily. And I've actually just finished a book uh, during lockdown. So that's one benefit, writing about running your first comrades marathon and running your first marathon. And I've used my old training diaries from way back in 1976 when I started. And by sheer chance I did the right thing which is I did it very gently so my first run was 10 minutes around the Vitz rugby fields uh, and I did it at night because I didn't want anyone to see me because runners <laughs> were on site and I thought people would laugh at me and then I very gradually built that up and I did it about three or four times a week and then gradually built that up and obviously when you start becoming a champion then it's twice a day with gym work and it becomes hysterical no one wants you to do that uh, but then also what I would say is have a full medical checkup before you start. Um, and then just do it very gently. Because if you make it very easy and very gentle, you don't have a problem with going back the next day. But if you make exercise a chore and unpleasant, at the very first opportunity, like cold weather, you will stop. And then you'll never go. So make so, sure it's something you enjoy doing, whether it's cycling. It has to be fun. It has to be yeah. fun. Um, and once it's fun... Um, then go for it. And I'm not an evangelist for running. It's whatever your particular sport yes. is, whether it's swimming or cycling or, or gymming or just walking. Walking is fabulous. Um, but just make it a part of your day. I would say at least four to five times a week, you know, for half an hour at least. And then you will become addicted and you will never not want to do it after that. Yeah. And I think often, you know, when we're all working and we become parents and we become grandparents, whatever it is, we, we, we place so much emphasis on taking care of everybody else, taking care of everybody else's needs. We often forget what our needs are and exercise becomes the exception rather than the rule. And I've more learned as I'm getting on in years that it's got to become the rule. It really has to become the rule in your life. Uh, for me, it's the first thing I slot into every day. Yeah. There, and if I have a, a particularly busy day, I will find some way that I can fit it in. Uh, and so I, in my case, of it, out of two weeks, I'll miss one day. And that will be because of work pressure or just travel mm -hmm. or something like that. But that's how strict I am. I slot it in every day. Exactly. And nothing can interfere with that. So what have you had to change as you got older, Bruce, in terms of still wanting to do the thing you love, but I'm sure you've had to tweak things, whether it was diet, whether it was, you know, adding more Q10 to the joints, or <laughs> whatever it is. You uh, well, the first major adjustment is, is understanding yeah. that you can't win anymore if you're me. So thank you so much for watching me back then. That was a long time ago. It's fitting that I'm actually an archaeologist by training. <laughs> So one was so long ago, I think they used to write the results in hieroglyphics, but <laughs> yeah. so first of all, you adjust to the fact that you do get slower. That's a natural process. And, uh, but, but enjoy that because in a way I've, I've, I've loved my running since being competitive because I no longer have to have those pressures. So I run for the fun of it. Uh, this morning with my mates, when we got to the top of a steep hill, we stop, we wait for the slow guys. And, and that kind of thing. I think I've also adjusted to the fact that my marathon days as such are probably over. Um, they're not going to be any more, barring one, and who knows, if somebody invites me to the Paris Marathon, 
wow, I'm going to go. But I think there's, there's no. yeah. too many marathons in my life. And I'm enjoying the shorter distance. I love the Vitality series, which sadly we had to uh, scrap this year, but I'm sure it'll be back next year. And, uh, you know, half marathon I love. And it's just understanding that maybe you can't be as, as outrageous as you were when you were younger, but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy it and have fun. Oh, fantastic, Bruce. How inspirational. What an inspiration you are to, to, to the rest of us, not just, you know, those, those who are sort of uh, 65 plus and then those who are, the, the session is relevant to, but the rest of us as well, who probably can't keep up with you, even if we tried now. So stay with us, because I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you as well. Uh, from in the webinar. Thanks so much for that, Bruce Fordyce, champion Bruce Fordyce. Thanks for your time. So next up, uh, let's head on over to Dr. Kalula. And like we said, she's the expert when it comes to geriatrics. Uh, Dr. Kalula, hi there. And, and welcome uh, once again. And thanks again for, for taking the time out from your very busy schedule and research to, to make time for people who absolutely need this information. Now, you are an expert in falls risks as well. And I didn't quite understand when I saw this, what falls risks does it have to do with insurance? Does it have to do with something that's you know, way beyond me? But just a quick explanation of what that is. Uh, well, uh, falls are quite common in the extreme ages. They are common in children and they are common in older people. And the, they are risk factors to a fall. And the, that's what I'm going to address today. And okay, it's so it's quite literally what we say when we talk about falls risks. Literally that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. So it's, it, what I'm going to talk about is not a fall where someone pushes you over not that type of fall. I'm going to take falls where one to, says what caused this exactly so that it can be managed and All right. not further so, falls. So to that point, Doc, let's talk about now the health considerations for people who have reached this milestone in life. We're talking about 65 plus in the context of falls risks. Well, uh, what has been addressed so far is the, what one needs to do to postpone that likelihood of having a fall. Maybe now and again, we all kick against a, you know, a brick or a branch or whatever and fall. That happens. But the, when it's happening more frequently, there is something that has to be looked into. It's because of the consequences. That's why we must take falls seriously. All right, so you've prepared a presentation for us. We'll hand over to you yeah. with that. Yeah, thank you. I'll just share the presentation. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, so again, thank you for the invitation from uh, Discovery Vitality Program for me to address this. Other than talking about falls, I've been asked to also address cognitive decline and the dementia, which are common syndromes as we get older. Now, as I said in, in my introduction, a fall is an incident in which a person unintentionally comes to rest on the ground floor or other lower level, and this is with or without an injury. Uh, the one, why I'm saying with or without an injury is because sometimes people fall, they dust themselves and say, I'm okay, I did not injure myself and do nothing about it. And that's not right. So falls occur when there is impairment in multiple domains that uh, happen in an individual to make us uh, maintain that postural stability. So why do humans fall? I think the uh, fact that we stand on two legs, we are uh, inherently un unstable. In order to maintain our upright posture, which maybe we take for granted, we need a brain that can process information effectively. We need joints that are well functioning uh, proprioception that is intact, that is knowing where you are in space, uh, good sensation in, in the feet especially, 
muscle strength, good vestibular function, and also good vision. So there are certain uh, changes that happen to all of us as we get older. Uh, neurologically, it was mentioned that uh, there is increased reaction time. So if something drops for you to catch it, you know, that becomes a bit slower. And if we bump into something to right ourselves up, it's a bit slower again. And as part of aging, there is a certain degree of muscle, loss of muscle mass and strength. And why dizziness is probably also common in older people is that there is decreased barrel reflex uh, sensitivity. Uh, this, this is the, what controls our blood pressure when we change posture from say lying down to standing or sitting to standing. The body has to adjust the blood pressure very quickly so that we don't get that dizzy feeling. And with age, that slows down a bit. And we know about the visual changes, you know, uh, farsightedness and so on. Uh, when going downstairs, being cautious because it's very, uh, it's not easy to judge the distance uh, on, on, on the uh, staircase. Uh, there are also changes in gait that we see. I think teenagers walk differently from us older people. Uh, but again, even with saying all this, uh, the so-called age-related changes shouldn't be uh, confused with the illness. Most of the changes are due to disuse and not uh, chronological age as such as the, has been demonstrated by Bruce. Now, as I said, uh, this blue bar here shows a single fall and one fall in, you know, does not differ according to uh, age. But we can see that as we get older, the frequency of having uh, multiple falls increases. And uh, that is what is of a concern. Now, there are consequences to a fall. Uh, for Dr. example, Dr. Dr. Uh, I just to, I just need to get in there very quickly. It seems that our audience is battling to see your presentation. So we need you to go into presentation mode so they are able to see this because we don't want them to miss okay. this information. Okay. Sincere apologies. Okay, I, I think that's yeah. much better. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. You can turn. Oh, okay, I apologize for that. Yeah, so the consequences of the fall, you know, between children and older people are a bit different. If an older person is frail and they cannot get up, they would probably have what is called a long lie. And even a few hours of lying down can lead to pressure sores, dehydration, because as we get older, the water content in the body is lower than when we are young. So dehydration happens very easily and the lying down can lead to pneumonia. Uh, physical injuries, uh, we, we know about that. For younger people, they tend to fracture many the wrists. By younger people, I mean the younger old because they try to stop that fall with, with the, 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 uh, the wrist. Uh, the hip fracture is a life-changing event, and the, that's why we really need to uh, consider doing all we can to prevent falls. And spinal fra fractures, we know they do change posture of someone uh, permanently. However, having a fall with or without injury creates a situation of fear of falls that is not wanting to walk because I'm going to fall and trying to grab on objects uh, as one, you know, uh, goes around. There is loss of confidence, uh, depression, and then dependency on other people to do things for one uh, increases in that uh, case. And the, with fear of falling, loss of confidence, uh, there is a downward spiral of not wanting to to move 
and then the body becomes deconditioned, uh, which leads to social withdrawal, one cannot go out, and the, where there are institutions, it's one of the common causes for people ending up in the institutions. So the risk factors themselves are classified into either biological, which is what uh, happens in one's body, uh, behavior, socioeconomic, and the environmental. So looking at biological uh, uh, factors, balance uh, abnormalities are common, muscle weakness, as I uh, mentioned, Advancing age, as we saw, that the recurrent falls are commoner as we get older. Uh, visual impairment can uh, lead to, to falls. Acute illness, during an acute illness, one becomes more unstable. And a number of chronic diseases, obviously, that impact on gait, vision, muscle uh, strength, and so on. Uh, even uh, urinary incontinence can result in falls because one rushes to reach the, the, the toilet. Uh, the behavioral factors are, for example, history of previous falls. If one has had a fall, it's likely that they will do, you know, have another fall in future. Lack of exercise, fear of falls I've, I've mentioned. Uh, lack of sleep, which was mentioned in the, uh, uh, by Dr. Patel, excessive alcohol uh, can lead to falls as well. And so are the medications that we use, some antipsychotics, the sedatives that we use maybe to curb anxiety or have sleep, and the antidepressants. Uh, Social economic ones, uh, you, you, your nutrition might be poor, living, poor living conditions, and the, the environmental hazards around uh, also predispose people to having falls. Uh, just to mention quickly, you don't need to see everything here. It's just a list of common medications that can lead to falls, and most of the medications cause postural hypotension. Uh, uh, th that is one of the commonest side effects leading to falls, or they can cause stiffness, like a Parkinsonism-like uh, syndrome. Um, some of them, some antidepressants, actually cause a degree of cognitive impairment. And the uh, sleeping tablets you know, can cause the unsteadiness, what we need to remember is that as we get older, the, the breakdown of medications in the body is much slower. So one would take a sleeping tablet, but that sleeping tablet keeps functioning during the day as well, because we don't eliminate medications efficiently. So now looking at the cognitive decline and dementia, as we get older, there is a change in, you know, how we remember things, where did I put my keys? So it's a spectrum from what is normal, what is mild cognitive impairment. And when we go to dementia, there are again different stages of it, mild, moderate, and severe. But when making a diagnosis of dementia, one needs to have decline in one or more of the cognitive domains, which I will show uh, in the next slide. So if we look at language, you know, trying to remember a, a, the word to say, or making up a sentence that has a good meaning, uh, picking up a spoon and spontaneously saying, this is a spoon. Uh, th uh, things like that uh, get affected. The learning memory also, uh, recognition, long-term memory uh, gets affected. Uh, looking at executive function, if you are traveling on a, you know, a holiday or going for a picnic, what do you want to do? That is what executive functioning is. And then complex attention, where one focuses on one thing 
and having selective attention, what happens is, for example, if children are playing around somebody, you can close off their, you know, whatever noise they are making and continue what you are doing. But for someone with dementia, that is very difficult. And then the social uh, cognition is where you judge emotions, how to interact with people, and so on and so forth. So any uh, one or two or more of these getting uh, dysfunctional uh, is what people then conclude that there is underlying dementia. So there are risk factors that predispose people to having uh, uh, develop uh, mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Uh, brain injury, we know history of, uh, for example, boxers who end up with the dementia is the recurrent trauma that predisposes to that. Obesity, hypertension, starting in midlife, uh, smoking, diabetes, history of depression, sleep disturbances, including obstructive sleep apnea. That is when one is sleeping and for a period they stop smoke, uh, what, uh, breathing. And because of the buildup of carbon dioxide in the, in the body, suddenly they start breathing again. That is the obstructive sleep apnea. And obviously cholesterol and other lipids uh, are risk factors for uh, uh, developing cognitive uh, decline. Uh, years of formal education, uh, decrease the risk factor, the higher the education, the, uh, uh, the better the uh, protection. But education is lifelong, so never stop if you have got an opportunity. Physical activity, health diet, cognitive training, moderation in alcohol, and social engagement. Those are the things that are, they decrease the risk uh, of one going into uh, mild cognitive impairment or dementia. But what I should mention is that not everybody that develops mild cognitive impairment develops dementia. Only about, you know, 30% people with mild cognitive impairment will, go, will develop a full syndrome of dementia. So some risk factors we can change, others we cannot. Uh, age, for example, uh, the higher the age, the, uh, the, the incidence of dementia increases as the age, as, as the, uh, the age group uh, gets older. Uh, there are genetic factors, but these only com contribute about 35% of the likelihood. Uh, what happens in addition to genetic factors is the uh, what lets uh, one develop the dementia syndrome. Uh, there are medical illnesses, especially atrial fibrillation, which an, is a heart rhythm uh, disorder, chronic kidney disease, mo most likely because it shares the same causes as uh, vascular, cardiovascular disease, uh, certain infections, HIV, Syphilis and the tertiary if syphilis is the one uh, that is related to dementia. Medications have uh, uh, explained vitamin deficiencies, chronic electrolyte imbalance in this, especially of sodium and calcium, uh, chronic hypoxia, uh, that is the lack of 100% oxygen in the, you know, at most times in the body, thyroid dysfunction physical inactivity, social isolation, hearing loss, and the air pollution uh, risk factors for cognitive decline. So uh, if one has preserved hearing, keeps educating themselves, and th there is cognitive uh, training, rich social network and reduced depression, exercise, all those lead to increased brain cognitive reserve. So even if one starts losing some neurons in the brain, you are starting at a higher level. That's where education comes in because your neurons are at a lower level and you lose 
a certain amount, you easily go into dementia. Whereas if you have reserve capacity, you are protected for a number of years. Uh, we can also reduce brain inflammation from diet and, and good exercise, uh, reducing obesity, smoking, and the, uh, treating medical conditions making sure that our medications are reviewed, even if we have had them for many years, the medications. As we get older, maybe they need to be adjusted because our body handles medications differently. And yeah. doing all this will reduce brain damage and the, the likelihood of developing cognitive impairment. So well, such wonderful information, Dr. Kalula, and uh, I think it, it'll be a good time here for us to just go to our in-house uh, biokineticist, and that's Marie Leach, to actually just give a little bit of uh, a demonstration on the falls risk assessment so that it can speak to the stuff that you've actually uh, told us about in theory. Marie, uh, I think the floor is yours, so please give us that, uh, that demo. Great. Hi everyone, today I'm going to show you what you can expect when you go for your falls risk assessment, which forms part of the Vitality Health Check 65 Plus and the Vitality Functional Assessment. The test consists of three parts. First, we ask to answer a set of 12 questions around your risk of falling. Then you'll be asked to do the 30 seconds to stand chair, um, the chair test, and I'm going to show you how to do that. This test will assess your leg strength, which is really important for activities of daily living, such as walking, climbing stairs, getting in and out of the car, as well as the bar. Right, so when you go for the test, you'll be asked to sit on a firm chair. All right, the biokineticist or the nurse will have a timer, and they will then ask you that on the word go, you'll be asked to stand up straight and sit back down again. You will then, they will count the number of repetitions that you can complete within the 30 seconds, Okay, and then you'll be scored and you'll be advised whether that falls within normal ranges or below normal ranges. All right. Uh, what's also important to note is that when you do this test, you won't be able to support yourself or rest on the armrest of the chair. So you'll have to use your leg muscles to stand up and sit down properly. The next part of the test is the four stage balance test. This is a static balance test. So as Dr. Kalula mentioned, Balance is really important because it helps us to react faster when we trip over something or we stumble over, you know, there's sometimes a pavement that's uneven, okay? And by reacting faster, it can help us to actually prevent a fall. So again, this test consists of four parts. First, you'll be asked to stand with your feet right next to each other. So if you can see my feet, all right. Okay, in that position, you'll be asked to keep this position for 10 seconds, all right? Once you manage 10 seconds without losing your balance, you'll move over to the second part, which is called the semi tandem stance. In that position, I'll show you sideways, you'll be placing the big toe of that one foot right next to the instep of the other foot. Again, if you can maintain this position for 10 seconds without losing your balance, you'll move over to the third part, which is called the tandem stance. In this position, you will place the front foot right in front of the back foot, so that the heel of the front foot is touching the toes on the back foot. Okay, again, if I can balance for 10 seconds without having to steady myself, I will move over to the final part of this test, which is a single leg balance test. This we will do on both legs, like left and the right side. And again, we are looking and see whether you can complete 10 seconds without losing your balance. The great part about this test is that you can use these test exercises and incorporate them into your daily exercises to help maintain and improve your leg strength and balance and ultimately lower your risk for falls. Over to you, Yuleka. All right, well, I'm exhausted after that demo. <laughs> I'm quite tired. <laughs> I worked up a sweat just watching you. Thanks, Marie. Okay, so look, folks, I think we all need to be motivated to actually exercise. But while we want to be motivated, we also want to know what rewards we can actually get at the end of all of this. So let's give you a quick idea of how you do this. And it all goes down to our app and how to activate your Vitality Active Rewards. So let's play you a quick video as to how you actually do this. So it's going to be step by step. It's very easy. And that video is going to come up in just a moment. So what you have to do is download the latest version of the discovery app. So what you do is you get there, go to your app store, 
and you download the app. Here is, it's gonna take you step-by-step step through there. So open your Discovery app, very simple. Select Activate Now under Vitality Active Rewards. Select Get Started, very simple. It's all spelled, it's all spelled out there for you. Select Next. So scroll till you find Next. Next, answer just a few questions about your health. We promise we don't get too personal with you. And then select Give Access to link your health app. And that's where you choose which health categories the discovery is allowed to access, what it is you actually want us to know about you. And if you are comfortable with the terms and conditions, select done. And it's simple. Welcome to Vitality Active Rewards. As simple as that. And there you'll be able to achieve your health drive or money goal to play on the game board. So it's as simple as that. And if you missed that demonstration, I'm just going to tell you that this entire webinar is being recorded and you will be able to watch it on our Facebook page, the Vitality at Home website as well uh, carries this for you. So you also need to know what is waiting there. What are the rewards for you if when you actually do activate this and we've put it down in simple uh, bullet points for you so you can have a look there and uh, your rewards. This is uh, what's going to be waiting there for you when you actually get there. You can get your actually get your full activation feedback uh, you'll get a refund with the Apple Watch benefit, which has also been reduced for you. And uh, it, it actually has a heart monitor, which is amazing as a safety device. And I think everybody needs to get their hands on that one. You can also save up to 75% on selected health monitoring devices with the health monitor device benefit. Save up to 25% on the Vitality Active Rewards Redemption worth 350 discovery miles or more. Isn't that fantastic? And then achieve your new daily goal of 7,500 steps. They're not as uh, many as you think they are. They go through quite quickly, actually, and earn 100 Vitality points. We've lowered the step goal for you in this refurbished package. So I'm going to speed this along because we've had some questions. We promised that we are going to answer a couple, but unfortunately, we might just be able to do one, but rest assured that the rest of your questions that, you, that you've that sent through or put through on our Q&A box will be answered on Facebook once this webinar is actually, uh, is, is actually over. So I'm going to go to the question. There is one for, for Bruce. Uh, Bruce, a question for you. At over 65, that's 65 plus, is walking better than running? And that, uh, that question coming through from Dennis, I hope I get your surname right, oh. Dennis. Bit of a tongue twister, Basarabi, I think it is. Dennis Basarabi, why has that question for you, Bruce? Gosh, Rebecca, that's a tricky one. It depends uh, what kind of physical state you're in. So I, I, I do both. And, I, you know, what, 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 is, what is better for you, you know, um, will, will really depend on what kind of exercise you want to get. So sometimes I walk. And uh, more often I run, but uh, I get value out of both. And it, I think they're equally as, as beneficial. And I know that as I get older, uh, I will not be able to run, but I certainly will carry on, on walking. Um, so probably walking is, uh, is closest to our, to our origins. You know, I mentioned I was an archaeologist. Uh, we, we walked. We walked in small bands as hunter-gatherers, and we did far more walking than we did running. So... Either, but uh, don't worry about walking if that's what's concerning you. Walking is great. Mm, okay, so yeah, I suppose it's just about knowing your capabilities and what your body is capable of. Bruce, Bruce, thank you so much. And, and a big thank you as well, Deepak Patel and Sebastiana Kalula, the, the doctors on the panel, and of course, Marie Leach for that hectic workout <laughs> that she, she gave us a little earlier, the assessment there. And of course, uh, you know, we all, at, at Vitality, the big belief is that you're only as old as your Vitality age. And like we say, everyone is, is getting younger and living longer at the moment. We just want to help you live a healthy lifestyle and make those healthy lifestyle choices. So don't just live, live it up with Vitality 65 Plus. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope we've been so helpful to you to help you get on with the best version of you from today onwards. Thank you very much. And don't forget, if you missed some of the points or you, or you didn't quite catch them, you can... Find them on our Facebook page and the website as well. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rebecca Rangpa. It's been a pleasure and I've learned so much. I'm so prepared for when this happens, when my time comes. Thank you, everybody.
And let's leave you with this video that's been prepared by our team just to inspire you just a little bit. What moves you, running your first 10Ks or being a superhero grandparent? Whatever it is, we're excited to help you keep moving so you can spend more time doing what you love. Our enhanced Vitality 65 Plus program helps you take care of your health with tailored advice and support, while rewarding you with discounts on selected health devices, the latest Apple Watch, weekly rewards, access to a Vitality coach and more. So don't just live, live it up and keep moving with Vitality 65 Plus. Join today. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day and uh, the weekend coming up. It's just a day away. It's Friday Eve. Bye-bye.